So our final session of the afternoon will be an enlightening conversation with four of our deans, led by Provost and Senior Vice President Nadine Aubrey. Provost Aubrey joined Tufts this past July. As Provost, Dr. Aubrey oversees eight Tufts degree granting schools and numerous interdisciplinary programs, centers, and institutes on all four campuses. Dr. Aubrey is an internationally recognized scholar and academic innovator who has made notable contributions in fluid dynamics. Prior to joining Tufts, Dr. Aubrey served as Dean of the College of Engineering at Northeastern and head of the Department of Me Mechanical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon. Dr. Aubrey grew up in France and holds degrees in mechanical engineering from Institut National Polytechnique Grenoble and from Université Grenoble Alps. That was my French back in high school. How was that? <laughs> in mechanical engineering. She also holds a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Cornell. I'm now going to turn the stage over to Provost Aubrey. Thank you. Well, can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Gina, and um, I would like to express my warmest welcome to all of you parents of our fabulous students here at Tufts. Um, as you heard, I'm very new here um, as Provost and Senior Vice President of this great university, and it's only a privilege and a pleasure and a honor for me to be here today. Um, Again, I come from France a long time ago. French people don't, <laughs> don't lose their accent. <laughs> Even though I have three grown children who always say, Mom, that's not the way you, you say so-and-so. <laughs> uh, but I came 25, ago, 25 years ago to this country, and um, it, it has been a f fabulous journey for me. Uh, I came originally to get my doctoral degree, and then um, I have stayed here um, uh, to work in academia. I've been at uh, various universities. And um, when the opportunity for me uh, came to join this wonderful institution as provost, um, I thought it was the right place and the right time for me. And three months later, I only think that I made the right decision. This is a fabulous, fabulous institution which is really student-centered, and for a top research institution like Tufts, uh, this is kind of a unique situation, and, and I love that, of course. Um, you are going to hear from our deans how, um, how much we care about our students, um, and not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, and that came all the way from um, our president, President Monaco. Uh, but only um, you can feel that at all level of our, administra our deans, our administration, our faculty, our staff, everybody is just so dedicated to delivering the very, very best education for the very best learning of our students. Um, this is a university which is really uh, focused on academic excellence uh, in, in terms of education, but um, it's very special. Uh, in terms of not only uh, teaching our students in the classroom, but also giving them all kinds of experiences. And, and actually, I call, I've been starting to call this the Tufts pathway, uh, which is very different from other universities. And you are going to hear, for example, um, from one of our deans that civic engagement is very central to what we do here, to the education that we deliver our students. Uh, it's, in, it's actually an integral part of education. And, and a lot of other universities are talking about this, but only Tufts has been a pioneer in, in, this, in, in this field. Uh, the Tisch College, even though, even though it was not called like this uh, before, um, has been in existence for 20 years, and, and, and you are going to hear all kinds of great initiatives that we have here at Tufts. But it's not only about civic engagement, it's also the culture, the collegiality of our students, of our faculty. Everybody is only collaborating with one, one another. To really be good citizens, um, solve 
uh, big problems of the world that, that we have as a society. And so we engage our students in, in research, in projects, um, in our um, student clubs. We have over 300 student clubs, uh, which are phenomenal experiences for our students. Um, we, we also encourage our students to interact with the external world, uh, either through internships, uh, some kind of practicum experiences, uh, our clubs themselves sometimes are uh, uh, engaged with the outside world, um, etc. Entrepreneurship and innovation is also very, very important to us. So really a very special type of education. Um, but I'd like, after this very brief introduction, I'd like to not uh, take too much uh, of your time. Uh, so welcome uh, to this event, and I'd like to now introduce our fabulous deans here at Tufts, who again are uh, caring tremendously for our students, and I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Dr. Jim Glazer, who is the Dean of Arts and Sciences, which is the largest college and, and, and oldest college probably as well at this um, uh, university, and he's a wonderful, great leader, again, who cares deeply about uh, his students in his college, so Dean Glazer. Thank you, Nadine. Um, Jim Glazer, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Political Science. I came up through the faculty. I consider myself a professor first, actually. It's very much a part of my identity. I think my faculty colleagues will, my dean colleagues who came up through the faculty will also share that. Um, I've been at Tufts for 28 years. I came here in 1991 from California, University of California, Berkeley, and my wife and I thought we'd be here for three years, and somehow that didn't happen. Uh, and um, I've been a dean now, this is my 17th year as a dean, and my sixth year in this particular role. Um, and then I think the other thing to note is that um, I'm a Tufts parent twice over, and that both of my children graduated from Tufts uh, in 2014 and in 2017. Uh, both of them are employed, one of them very well employed. <laughs> my sociology degreed daughter is very well employed, for those of you who are concerned about your uh, humanities or social science students. Uh, and uh, my son is planning to go to graduate school. So um, uh, Tufts has really prepared them well for the world, and I'm a, an appreciator of Tufts as a parent as well as a, a dean and faculty member. Thank you very much, Dean Glazer. Uh, next is uh, Dean Alan Solomon, our famous dean of the famous uh, Tisch College for Civic Life here at Tufts. Well, thank dean you very Sonnement. much. Thank you, Nadine. And first of all, I want to say congratulations to all the parents um, for, for having your children um, seek, be educated here. They must be remarkable young people who have been admitted in a highly competitive situation to this university, not only because of their academic uh, achievements, but Tufts attracts a certain kind of student, uh, a student who is um, very socially conscious, who's intellectually curious, who's collaborative, and, um, and, and brings a lot of really great values to this university. And so you must all be, have done something really well, and I congratulate you for it. Um, I, was, uh, I first set foot on this campus 54 years ago as a freshman and uh, graduated in 1970. Um, Tufts changed my life. Um, my education here um, has informed everything else in a rather um, non-linear uh, set of careers. Um, I re-engaged with the university 25 years ago, uh, originally as the founding board chair of the college of which I am now the dean. I served on the board of trustees for 10 years. I was a visiting instructor in political science. Uh, and I also am the parent of a Tufts alumna. And uh, I had the... Um, after six, six careers, I had the opportunity to come back here uh, as the dean of the Tisch College, and it's been a real homecoming, but it's really been an opportunity, though, for me, first of all, to give back to a university that contributed so much to my life, but also to give me an opportunity to help 
uh, prepare the next generation of young people um, to go out into the world and make contributions to their community, to their nation, and to the world. Um, and also, through our research, um, to also help figure out some of the things that ail our democracy and even uh, prepare this generation to fix them. Thank you, yeah. Alan. Next is our Dean uh, Jianming Q, who is the Dean of the School of Engineering here at Tufts. Um, this is the, uh, not younger school, because we have a younger school, but one of the younger schools here at Tufts, which was uh, within Arts and Sciences a few years ago, but um, um, uh, became its own a few years ago. And Dean Q has been a phenomenal leader we're only growing the school in terms of education and research tremendously. So, Dean Q. Thank you, Nadine. Um, welcome back to TOPS. Um, first of all, thank you all for entrusting your children to us. Uh, I, I, I hope that uh, we will live up to that uh, expectation. Um, unlike uh, Dean Glazer and Dean uh, uh, Solomon, I am the new kid on the block. Uh, I don't have a long history of a connection to Tufts. Uh, this is the beginning of my fifth year. Um, I, like uh, the provost, um, uh, wasn't born here. I, I was born in China and was educated there. Came to the U.S. in 1983 uh, for my graduate studies. I went to Northwestern, got my PhD there at Northwestern in mechanical engineering. Then I went to teach at Georgia Tech in the mechanical engineering department there for 20 years. Uh, in 2009, came back to Northwestern, uh, become a faculty member there for six years. Then I joined uh, Tufts in 2015. So it's been um, almost uh, uh, five years. I've uh, been loving this place every day. Um, it's a fantastic place, like Nadine was saying, very unique. Um, we um, we are one of the universities uh, in the country that has some unique strength uh, and, and, and no one else uh, uh, can actually match us. So uh, congratulations having your kids here. I'm sure they will get a fantastic education. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Q. And last but not least, uh, Dean Nancy Bauer, who is our Dean of the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, as I said, this is the youngest school that we have. Uh, it's located um, uh, on Huntington Avenue in Boston. Uh, so we have a campus there. And I was just visiting two days ago and um, it was a fabulous visit. I think that what we do there is um, significant, uh, not only for the students whose major is in the fine arts, but also for all the students, and we already have a large number of students who uh, go to that campus. So please, Dr. Bao, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Nadine. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name again is Nancy Bauer. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Tufts. I've been here since 1998. Um, and um, I have been a dean in the School of Arts and Sciences uh, for the last, this is I guess my eighth year doing that. And I had signed up to be a dean very reluctantly. And the reason, because I just thought I won't, I don't think I'm a good fit for that job, um, given the kind of work that I do. But um, I also, at the same time, was starting to think about writing a book, which I'm doing now, on the philosophy of higher education. And I thought, I'll do three years as dean, and then I'll step down and write this book. But at the very end, the last month of my third year, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston approached Tufts and said, we would like you to submit a proposal to um, become the parent of the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and run it. And uh, I went to Jim, and Jim and I talked about it, and he said, well, you should write that, because at the time, I was the dean of all the other arts departments and care very deeply about art and write about philosophy of, of film and the other arts. And so I wrote the proposal, and I said, here's the proposal, good, goodbye and good luck. <laughs> then the museum accepted the proposal, and the university said, can't you just stay on? You've spent so much time there, you should, so here I am. 
an effort, I'll skip the rest of it. Um, this is my fourth year as the inaugural dean of the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, which I became when I said to Jim, the only thing I have left to do is figure out who the dean should be. And he said, I know who it is, I'm looking at her. And I was like, where is she? <laughs> um, anyway, um, the school is, um, I'm so proud of Tufts um, for in 2015-16 uh, uh, adopting an art school and understanding the value of students being able to think really creatively about problem solving. Um, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts is a very much a research um, and thinking based school and has been um, for all of its almost 150 year history. Um, and it is, has been so exciting to see our school collaborate with, and uh, Dean Q and I were just talking about this, uh, quite a few engineers um, in the engineering school. Um, many, many of our faculty members are affiliated with Tisch College and very actively involved in its initiatives. And we have been also collaborating with the medical school, the Fletcher School, um, every school, um, and, and the other schools um, at Tufts. So it's really a pleasure to be here um, and with my esteemed colleagues and representing our little engine that could. Thank you, Dean Bauer. So um, next on our schedule is for me to ask our deans a few questions and then um, we'll open it for you to ask your own questions. Uh, but I'd like to start with uh, Dean Solomon. And um, recognizing that Dean Solomon has been uh, involved in many ways over many years with Tufts, what motivated you to come back to Tufts as the, as the Dean of the Tisch College for Civic Life? As I said, it was really a, a homecoming for me. Um, I don't know if, if many of you have had a chance to meet Saul Gittleman, who was the longest serving provost in American higher education and has been teaching here for, taught here for decades. Um, I was actually- Big challenge here uh, in front of me. <laughs> You're up to it. Um, I was a student of his back in 1967 or so. Um, uh, so part of it was that, um, but part of it was one of the things that I think makes Tufts University quite distinctive, um, which is that it prepares it, it intentionally prepares its students to go out into the world, regardless of what they study, regardless of the careers they choose, to participate in civic life. And as I said, to make contributions uh, to community, to nation, to the world, regardless of whether they're a citizen engineer, uh, or a citizen artist, uh, or a physician, or um, a scholar and a faculty member, um, and that, so we are a college, Tisch is a college and with a dean, and I sit with my colleagues in the provost council, but nobody graduates from uh, Tufts University with Tisch College on their diploma. Our mission really is to influence the education of all 11,500 students at this university, whether they're in the medical school, the engineering school, or arts and sciences. And that is truly um, something that makes Tufts University really distinctive. Most of higher education is beginning to think about civic responsibility, preparing young people for democracy, um, but nobody has housed that mission, has given that mission the standing of a college. No one has, um, I think, really has a the tr a, as long a tradition as we have of engaging that. And so having the opportunity to be part of um, educating students in that way, of working with faculty, um, to actually study some of the issues that we, that we confront today, both in this country and around the world, having to do with civil society, having to do with democracy, and actually also uh, having an opportunity to um, oversee a research agenda where we really uh, study issues having to do with civic education and the civic and political engagement of young people. Um, I couldn't have sat down and created a more exciting, or fulfilling job for myself at this stage in my life. So I feel very blessed to be here. Wonderful. Well, we feel very blessed to have you as the Dean of the Tisch College as well. Thank you so much, Alan. The next uh, question is for Dean Glazer. Uh, Dean Glazer, as you heard, has been on the faculty here at Tufts, the youngest, uh, the, the, the longest. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll take youngest. That's okay He's also too. the youngest, probably. <laughs> um, Dean Glazer, uh, which kind of changes have you seen uh, during uh, that time uh, over the years? 20 plus years or yeah, so? Yeah, close to 30. Um, 20, 20. 28, I think. Um, well, um, first of all, I would say that through this entire period of time, I've had spectacular students. Um, I would say that there's a difference, though, uh, from when I got here. I don't know, do you remember, certainly most of you would remember the, the TV show Seinfeld. And Elaine Bennis, the fictional character, is a Tufts alum. Nobody knows, but uh, there's one episode that uh, she's very um, animated and she says something about, uh, I'm a Tufts alum, I went to Tufts, and it was my backup school or something like that. Uh, and when I first got here, uh, I heard that quite a lot. And you don't hear that anymore. <laughs> this is a destination now. Uh, we've always had terrific students. I think we have more of them than we used to have, but we've always had really good students and I've had many students go out into the world and do really fantastic things. In fact, I'm not going to be here this, uh, over this weekend because I'm heading down to North Carolina in a few hours uh, because a former student of mine uh, is getting married and um, uh, he's a, a tenured faculty member at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, and he and I uh, wrote a book together uh, after he left Tufts, um, but it's a, a relationship that I hold very dear and, um, uh, and I think is emblematic of the kinds of relationships that, that we are able to forge with our, with our students. The, the second big thing that I've noticed, and, and it, this really has accelerated in recent years, is that our infrastructure has improved so much. For those of you who are Tufts alums and you walk around and you see um, new buildings, very improved buildings, um, we have you know, new, um, a new energy plant, we have the, the residence halls have really gotten a lot of attention. Uh, two brand new uh, academic buildings with a third one in the ground right now. And um, there's been a lot of attention to the physical plant of the university and that's been very big. And then the third big thing really is that we've added to the institution with the Tisch College and with the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Both of those things have happened. Um, while I've been here, they've made a big difference. They've built upon things that were already here um, and um, they've enhanced both the curriculum that we have, the culture that we aspire to, and the kinds of opportunities that we give to our students. Um, I would say this about the SMFA, the, the one thing I would add to Nancy's humble um, uh, introduction about the SMFA was we competed with other universities in the Boston area. It wasn't just that they had one proposal, they had I think four or five proposals from universities across the city and they picked us, they chose us, we were the right home for them and I think we have shown that that was a good choice. So those are the three big things that I can think of. Uh, and you can still see Elaine Bennis on reruns uh, <laughs> talking about her Tufts connection. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, as you can see, um, it's not um, at all universities that you can see the dean going to the wedding of his or her former students. So it only speaks highly about how much we care about our students and um, how much we follow also who they become after graduation. But talking about the um, arts, I'd like to invite uh, Dean Bauer, uh, who is now in, the, in her fourth year as Dean of the SMFA, uh, to tell us uh, um, how excited she is about the arts and the role that they play in uh, a tough education. So Nancy. Thank you again, Nadine. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I want to emphasize is that if anything, when universities are these days thinking about um, their art schools or their art departments, they're, they're thinking potentially about cutting them, either entirely or partially, because in many places the arts are seen as indispensable. Um, one of the really wonderful things about um, SMFA, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, with which Tufts had a very, very loose relationship of sort of cross-registration um, for a number of decades that no one was paying attention to, is that that school has always been about 
um, using art making and studying art as a form of research. So it's not the case that somebody um, at SMFA could major in um, graphic design and come out and be a graphic designer with nothing else going on. We have a few courses in graphic design, but the point of that school is to have students um, really think about what they care about and then really struggle with how to make them. What Tufts understands, and SMFA also understands, is that the problems that the world is facing now are new and different and very complex, and they require a kind of daring, creative thinking um, that, to be perfectly frank, most of our disciplines are still unable to do by themselves. Of course, you can have cross-disciplinary conversations, but what art making does is force you to find whatever it is that you need to know about and figure out how to get that information. Um, and so because of that, um, our faculty and students are collaborating at literally every school, again, um, at Tufts. Um, and one of the uh, courses I want to point out is one that we teach in our new science and engineering complex, which is only a few years old, which has an absolutely amazing, phenomenal maker space that was made for engineers. One of our faculty at SMFA has degrees in both engineering and the arts, and so teaches a course in that lab and has taught it several times that it's half engineers, half the slats go to hash engineers and half the slats go to the artists. And they teach each other. The artists teach the engineers not to just think about the numbers and the engineers teach the artists how to have a certain kind of rigor and how to expand uh, their thinking into really sitting for a very long time with a deep problem. And um, I'm so grateful, as I said, to, and. Uh, to Tufts, I'm very proud to be at this university because that kind of creative thinking is really considered absolutely essential for students at occasion. And in the School of Arts and Sciences, all of our students have been required for many decades to take courses in the arts, uh, and now they're, the bounty is overflowing for them. Thank you so much, Nancy. Well, we're very excited to have the arts here uh, and the interaction between uh, those students and, and students from other parts of the university. And uh, what Nancy just talked about, uh, about the focus on creativity, expression, uh, was really uh, very obvious when I visited, again, the SMFA two days ago and was very, very impressive. And the course, actually, also that she's talking about, I, I saw it when I visited the engineering school and in the new makerspace, in the new uh, science and engineering complex, indeed, they were artists working together with the engineers on, on making things and, and designing and, and making um, prototypes and expressing themselves. So that was very, very impressive. Um, Dean Q, um, you have worked at several schools before Tufts. Uh, we heard you talk about Georgia Tech, Northwestern, and then you came to Tufts. Um, how does Tufts differ from those previous schools you were at? Uh, like I said earlier, I taught 20 years at uh, Georgia Tech, six years at Northwestern, I got my PhD from Northwestern as well. And if you, if you look at the uh, higher ed uh, landscape in the US, uh, you will see on one end of the spectrum uh, are the small liberal arts colleges like Amherst, the Williams, right? Uh, they do fantastic job on undergrad teaching and they focus a lot on the uh, aspect of liberating the student's mind. But they don't have a research component. There is no expectation for the faculty to do research. On the other side, on the other end of the spectrum, you see these large uh, state schools most of the time, very research intensive places where research is the absolute number one priority for these universities, right? And if you look at the tops, we happen to be somewhere in the middle. It's the Goldilocks zone, as I call it. On one end, we provide the education uh, very similar to the liberal art uh, schools where we have high touch, project based, very small classes, uh, their intimate relationship between the student and the faculty and between the student and even the staff. And by the time your children graduate, the departments, the faculty will know everyone by their first, last, and where they came from. 
Um, in the meanwhile, the students are also exposed to the state of art research because our faculty are doing the cutting edge research. And the student will have an opportunity to see how the research is done and to be exposed to that environment. Many of them actually participate in the faculty's research lab, right? So now you have a university that has the small liberal art feel, but also the research intensive use of research university environment. So you get the both of both. I would say that's one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the uniqueness of a Tufts. The other thing I'd like to add to that is um, we do pay a lot of attention to undergrad teaching. And that goes across the board from, fa from hiring the faculty. When we interview with faculty, we don't look at just the research skill of the person, but also their passion for teaching, and particularly the undergrad teaching. We do fantastically well uh, regarding uh, student life and the engagement, right? We pay a lot of attention to the student's success, not only while they're in college, but also in the future. And we do really well in academic advising. I tell you, I said this many times, no one does it better than us in terms of academic advising. Even if you want to hide, you want to fall through the crack, you will not be able to do so. so. Well, thank you, uh, John Min. Very well put. <laughs> Talking about research, um, I'd like to invite any of you to make some comments about the research uh, which is going on in any of your schools and how our undergraduate students get involved. So thank you, um, Janmin, for raising the issue, as, as well as all of you. Actually, everybody has talked about research. So Alan would like to make the first comment. Well, we made, since we knew you would all be here today and and I'd have the opportunity to talk to you about what Tisch College does. We arranged to have on the front page of this morning's New York Times an article about research that Tisch College is doing on college student voting. So I hope you all get a chance to look at it. Um, don't think it was a coincidence. Um, but in fact, in addition to um, sponsoring a, a major in civic studies or working with other schools around incorporating civic engagement into their curriculum, as with engineering. We also are home to a nonpartisan independent research organization. We have 12, 20 full time researchers who are arguably among the nation's leading authorities in the area of civic education, K through 12, and also um, look at the civic and political participation of young people. So one of the projects we have is a project to, me to measure the rate at which college students across this country are participating uh, in democracy. And we have uh, access to the, anonymously the records of 10 million students in, in, a, in a thousand colleges and universities, that half of all the college students in America. And we're able to report to all of the participating institutions the rate at which their students are participating or registered or voting we break it down by gender, ethnicity. And what's happening in higher education is higher education is beginning to encourage its students to participate, something that hasn't happened in some years. Um, but the story in the Times records that, and it also records some of the partisan tension um, that has arisen around that. But we're very proud of the research agenda that we are engaged in, and the way that we engage students in that. We have a whole bunch of students who actually are research assistants, but then we try to bring the lessons of what we learn in our research home to this campus. So we support a student group, a, student, a volunteer student organization called Jumbo Votes, which um, uh, during election cycles goes out and tries to register students, tries to help them um, participate. And so we have, uh, we have probably a, a 60 student volunteers across the university that participate. They have the coolest t-shirts that if you'd like we can arranged for them to get them to, uh, distributed. And so we have this really robust research agenda, but we involve students and, for that matter, faculty as well. Can I just Thank you, Adam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, John Min? So, so, in, in the engineer school, every faculty member does research. Um, not only 
you do research, but also you do what we call the sponsored research, meaning that someone is sponsoring a research. Most of that is federal government, but a lot of the also from the industries as well, the foundations. Um, we do research in a pretty broad range of the areas that includes the environment, climate, energy, particularly sus sustainable energy. We do research on human robot or human technology interface. This is an area that's going to be tremendously important. It's more and more automation is put into place, right? Like your um, uh, autonomous cars in the future. Uh, how are you going to uh, uh, work with autonomous cars, right? So one of the areas of research is um, the trustworthiness of the AI system, the autonomous system. You know, you wouldn't get into a car when the driver is drunk, but would you be uh, willing to get in the car that drives by itself when you don't have any trust on the autonomous system? So that's one of the bigger areas that we do research. We have uh, several faculty who are on the, on the world renowned in that area. And the third area that we do research is um, uh, engineering for human health. Uh, and the biomedical engineering. Basically, we create uh, uh, science and technologies that will cure human diseases, right? And we have many, uh, let me give you one example, you might be uh, really interested in this. Two years ago, we had a faculty member who developed uh, the so-called tooth tattoo. It's basically like a, the artificial tattoo you can stick to your teeth. And what these tattoos do is to monitor the nutrition intake while you are eating, right? So uh, you measure the calories, the fat contents, the salt, the, the sugar, and, and, and the vitamins, and so forth. So imagine that with this technology, you can have, you can pull up your phone uh, and load the map, says I want to have 300 calories for breakfast, 200 for lunch, or whatever, and then after you eat, finish the donuts, the phone beeps says you have had enough. Right? So imagine these technologies will eventually uh, 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 improve uh, the quality of life, improve the health of, 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 of human beings. So that's another area. And the, third area, uh, the fourth area that we do research a lot is uh, Internet of Things, right? And uh, likely or not, we are all going to be connected in one way or the other in the future. So these sensor technologies, these internet connections, the large data are all going to be there. We have a large number of faculty doing research in that area. Um, the last but not least is learning sciences. And we actually occupy a very unique leadership uh, real estate uh, in that domain uh, in the country. Uh, and when I say uh, learning science, basically is to figure out how human beings particularly young people, like your children, learn things, and how do they remember things, right? Think about this, uh, think about this. Uh, the the uh, uh, student demographics over the last couple of decades have changed dramatically. The student population today is much, much more diverse than, say, 20, 30 years ago. And because of these students come from different culture backgrounds, language backgrounds, they all learn somewhat differently, right? How do you make sure that when you deliver the lecture, everybody learns as well as everybody else, right? So that's one challenge. The other one is, think about the technology uh, uh, advances in the last few decades. The things have changed so fast that new knowledge has accumulated uh, almost exponentially. And yet, we still only have four-year undergrad education. So with that much to learn, a four year to learn, they're just not possible. So you have to figure out a way to learn better, teach better, right? So that uh, you have to understand how the learning process takes place. And thanks to the generosity of, of a private foundation, we actually had an $80 million uh, 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 gift uh, that started the Institute for Institute of Research for Learning and Instruction. And the goal is to figure out how we can learn and teach more efficiently. So these are some of the highlights of the research in the engineering school. Thank you, gentlemen. And I'd like to invite uh, Dean Glazer to comment on some of the research in his um, school. 
uh, perhaps particularly on the uh, humanities and social oh, sure. sciences side, yeah. Yeah. that would be helpful. I yeah, think. I, I, I want to. Uh, I have a good example, but uh, but I want to say one thing uh, in addition to what Dean Q just said. Why does it matter to be in a place where research is valued and supported? And, and um, when students are part of that enterprise, it's, um, it's, it's very educational. Uh, research and, and scholarship is about discovery. Research and scholarship is about persuasion. Research and scholarship is about asking good questions and figuring out how to answer them. Uh, and, um, and being in a place where research is fostered and where research and scholarship are valued um, uh, is something very meaningful for a student. To, it's very meaningful to be in this environment. We actually uh, try to uh, create opportunities for students to participate in the enterprise that we as faculty are involved in. Uh, we have a summer scholars program, for instance, which allows about uh, 75 students a year to work in the summer, to get paid, working together with a faculty member on a research project. Uh, they don't have to wait tables or uh, nothing wrong with that, but uh, they don't have to wait tables, they don't have to uh, be a camp counselor. Uh, they can devote themselves entirely to a research project together one-on-one -on -one, with a faculty member. We have an undergraduate research fund that students can tap into to go to a conference, to, to obtain lab materials, to uh, go to an archive that they're a historian. Um, so, you know, we, tr we try to make sure that what we do is actually available to our undergraduates, and I think Nancy sh will talk a little bit about what that means uh, for the artists. Let me tell you about one particular student in the English department uh, who gave me, I mean, this story actually gives me goosebumps because it's such an incredible story. We have a student who took a course on Milton, the, the uh, British poet. Uh, he wrote 400, 450 years ago. And he wrote the, the epic poem, uh, Paradise Lost. And he embedded in this poem all kinds of riddles and acrostics that people have been studying for all these centuries. And one of our Tufts undergraduates discovered one of these riddles or acrostics uh, in the text, which nobody had noticed for 450 years. Unbelievable. Uh, Professor Filer, who's the chair of the English department, was so uh, impressed, he encouraged her to write it up. Uh, it's being published in the major journal for Milton scholars. Um, and, you know, here's something that experts have been poring over and studying for all these centuries, and a Tufts uh, junior uh, uh, found something in there that nobody else had ever seen before. Isn't that... Just one more thing, which is after we're done here, if you go out these doors and you make a left and you go down the hallway, in Alumni Lounge is a poster session where our summer scholars will be presenting the, the, the results of their work from this past uh, summer. So if you want to get a sense of the sort of rich array of things that, are, that our students are doing in engineering, in the SMFA, in social sciences, sciences and humanities, uh, you'll get a good picture of that out the door, make a left, down the hallway, and into Alumni Lounge. Thank you so much, Jim. Yeah, very impressive. And by the way, a very large number of students do research here. Uh, Dean Bauer, do, would you like to expand some of the introductory remarks you made on research at the SMFA? Yes. Um, I think people think that artists kind of go into their studios, maybe with a little calm music playing in the sun, streaming in through the window if it's a painting studio, and they put on their smock and their beret, and they like draw pretty things. Um, no one at the SMFA does that. If I asked them to do it, they probably would pretend they couldn't speak English because this would be so foreign. Um, let me give you um, just a couple examples that come to mind of, of what our uh, students and faculty do. Um, we, have a, um, we have a faculty member who is deeply involved um, with environmental studies. In fact, two of her Master of Fine Arts graduates um, got a coveted position in our um, Tufts um, Institute of the Environment um, doing sustainability work as jobs right after they graduated the first two years of the SMFA. This faculty member's name is Mary Ellen Strom, um, spends a lot of time in Montana 
creating enormous film uh, projections that she does on the sides of mesas and mountains to show exactly what these places will look like um, given the scientific research on how um, environmental havoc is going to be wreaked in those areas. And so ordinary people who are going for a vacation or who are living in the neighborhood can drive by these places at night, especially when these films are projected and really get an incredibly visceral sense of what's going to happen. Now to do that, she had to collaborate with earth scientists and many other people, and her students had to learn that work too. But that's the kind of project that an artist could do that's different from a scientific paper and different even from an article in a newspaper. I used to be a reporter for the Boston Globe, so I don't want to denigrate newspapers and I do research now. Um, but that makes an immediate impression on someone and wants them to learn more. And in this way, artists are really um, very important. I'll give you another example of another faculty member that, um, Nadine, you spent a long time talking to when you were, she was at the SMFA. She was supposed to be there till seven. And at eight o'clock, I called my husband and I said, I'm sorry, I'm an hour late, the provost is still here. And then I went up and got permission for her to leave and she was still going uh, many hours later after we started. Um, but we have a faculty member named Joel Frenzer. And Joel's uh, mother was, um, had developed Alzheimer's. And actually my mother has very bad dementia. Um, and Joel and I were actually talking quite a bit about, in some ways making, just sort of smiling at some of the things that our, that our moms were doing. But Joel became more and more interested in thinking about how ordinary people can learn to engage with a loved one who um, has experienced a kind of mental regression or decline. And so what Joel did is working very closely with doctors and with researchers, he um, took a, um, a, a leave with my permission and went back to um, his home in the Midwest uh, where, his mother, where his father was unable to communicate with his mother. And he made a series of videos that were based on his finding two decrepit um, stuffed animals in his old bedroom from 100,000 years ago. Um, and with the research he had done, showing you on screen how to interact with the mom. They are hilarious. Joel's a filmmaker and an animator. Um, these videos are funny. They're all three or four minutes long. They're hilarious and every single one, I mean, I actually may cry. I just was uh, visiting my mother in New Jersey yesterday. I have to go very often because my dad is ill as well. And it completely changed my own relationship with my mother. And so I showed the videos to the person who works with my mother, who happens to be the head person in the state of New Jersey where my parents live, um, who deals with patients with these kinds of issues. And she has disseminated them far and wide. And now all of the places in New Jersey that deal with anyone who has Alzheimer's are using Joel's videos to teach family members what it looks like to continue to have a meaningful relationship with your loved one. Um, sorry to go on and on about that, but I have goosebumps. I'm sure you can understand why. That like changed my life too. That was one of the, we always talk, academ academics like to talk about transformative experiences now. I'm sure you read that in many brochures from every college your student looked at. Um, that was really a transformative experience for me and I know for many other people who are trying to get something back instead of go forward with their, with their family member. Thank you so much, Nancy. Yeah. Okay, Dean Q yeah, would I like just, to add I just to want to add something very quickly. Remember the, the tooth tattoo I mentioned? One of the researchers in that group it was an undergrad uh, student from biomedical engineering department. So when they decided to publish the paper, he volunteered to put the a tattoo on his tooth and had picture taken of his teeth. And when the paper was published, overnight, there were thousands, literally thousands of tweets, you know, uh, uh, on the social media. So immediately he was known as the student with the most famous teeth. <laughs> Yeah, all these are really fascinating stories. I hope you all agree with me and with all of us and that your students are going to um, have such uh, transformational experiences here on campus. But I'd like to now to open um, the opportunity for you to um, give us some advice, uh, share uh, some of the experiences of your, stu of your, of your children, our students, and uh, ask any questions you may have for, for the deans and myself. Uh, 
Um, I, I just want to thank uh, the panel. Uh, I'm a Michael Diamond, a parent of a freshman, and uh, delighted to be in the Tufts community. Um, one of, I had the privilege of listening to uh, Richard Dreyfus, the famous actor, on Monday speaking about civics, and he's passionate about this topic. And he defines civics as learning to share political space with those whom you disagree. And I, he ties civics to civility. So I just wondered, perhaps, for Dean Solomon to start, if you could talk a little bit about how you're operationalizing that on campus, especially in light of the fact, I think all parents are aware, there have been a number of you know, very, uh, very significant uh, acts of bias. And you know, I'd like, perhaps, you to provide some context for that. So. I think, um, oh, thank you. Um, first of all, we bring sort of a theoretical uh, perspective to that in terms of how we define civic engagement, and, and we think civic engagement is about um, deliberation, collaboration, and relationship. So if you're really going to work on civic issues with other civic actors, you really have to learn to talk to, to deliberate, which means to learn to talk to people with whom you differ. You then need to go beyond just talking, but actually working together around a common, for a common goal, and that therefore uh, involves relationship. So that's sort of the theoretical framework that we bring to it. Um, and that's what we try to teach. We, we have a, now a major in civic studies. We, uh, we sponsor courses. We don't do anything ourselves. Everything we do, we do in collaboration uh, with other schools. So the civic studies major is in arts and sciences. We've worked with engineering uh, faculty to incorporate concepts of civic engagement into the uh, freshman uh, engineering courses. Uh, we run a series of, um, of uh, course, well, we run a couple of courses and, and many workshops to teach tough students how to talk, to, we use um, actually controversial science issues. We, we have a faculty member who's actually on the faculty of the dental school, and he's a research scientist, but he's very interested in what we call civic science, and in using controversial science issues to teach students how to talk to one another across differences and to put themselves in the shoes of others. Um, and then he trains other students to do that. We bring speakers uh, to campus across a broad range of uh, um, diverse perspectives. So this semester, we had Carl Rove here. We had Senator Ed Markey here. We're having Tarana Burke, who is the founder of the Me Too movement. We're having Spanish chef Jose Andres and former Attorney General Eric Holder. And we try to create opportunities for smaller groups of students, and sometimes students who might differ um, with these people, to have conversations. I would say this, um, I mentioned earlier that one of the areas of research that interests us is civic education in K through 12, because in some respects when young people get to college, I won't say it's too late, but they come here, frankly, without having learned. With our, with our concern in this country with high stakes testing, with STEM education, which is critical, uh, we did sort of neglect other aspects of education, including civic education. And so we're trying to figure out how to bring that back to the schools, but it also gives us the challenge of having come, people come here to, um, to study as college students who have never learned some of the skills um, of, of how you function in a democracy. So it's absolutely an important topic uh, across the university. Um, we're trying to uh, bring our expertise to bear. Um, you know, this is a period of great uh, political activity and activism. Uh, I was a student here in the 60s. My first visit to the president's office was uninvited. <laughs> so, so I've lived this, I've, lived, I've seen this movie before, although I do think that we have a bigger challenges now with greater polarization and, and a greater need to teach some of these basic skills. And we also have technology that, that sort of works against us in that regard. So I appreciate the question. And it's an important, something we get up every day uh, and work on uh, in collaboration with, with our colleagues. Yeah.
definitely a part of the education we deliver here at TAF, so we want to deliver. So thank you very much for this great question. Another question. Yes, good afternoon, um, and thank you all for um, sharing with us the um, tough experience um, here. Um, I would like to share with you a, a story about um, my coworker who, um, three, my son is a junior here at Tufts University, and I'm just honored to have him experience um, this school, and it has been very resourceful for him. Um, but my coworker's son was, is an overachiever, and um, he applied to various schools, including Harvard, and he used Tuff as a backup school, a safety school. Well, I'm pleased to announce to you that when he got his letters back, Tufts rejected him. But um, Harvard did take him in. So that said, that said us a lot about this school. So, um, you know, and I believe that it's, it starts from you, the deans, the head. So in one word, if you all could just please share with me in one word what your view of the tough experience um, here at Tufts University. Thank you. Thank you for a great question. Uh, Jim Glazer, perhaps? <laughs> Asking deans for one word is really very, very challenging. We can't clear our throats in 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to give one word on wh who our students are. I, uh, they're outward. They, they think about the world beyond the boundaries of the campus, and they're interested in changing it. Like Dean Belizer said, this is really difficult for us to shut up. Um, if I have to use only one word, I would say well-rounded. Yeah, I have a little, have a little story about this. Um, just after my announce, the announcement for my appointment as provost came up. Um, I, my, the first alumnus that I met was one, from Tufts was an engineer who said to me, you know, I, I grew up in the region, um, I knew I wanted to go uh, do engineering, um, and I only wanted to go to MIT, but I, I, I flanked, I, I was not admitted, so I had to go to Tufts. And that was the very best decision, decision that I ever met in my life. Uh, that allowed me to be really successful and had, uh, through all the courses, not only technical, but uh, from the humanities, from the social sciences, management, international relations, and that's why I've been so uh, successful in my life and career. So. It took me a while, but I came up with a word. After you. Uh, the reason your question really caught me short was because I didn't mention at the beginning that I have four children, three of whom went here. Those three kids are so different from one another that when they describe their tough experience, if you didn't use the word toughs, you would never know they all went to the same school. The other one, uh, the fourth one, went to Columbia, and though she got a good education, she was miserable the whole time she was there and was really thrilled to finish. And because of the, and I was, before I give you my word, I'm going to just say that when I first came to Tufts, I did all of my schooling at Tufts. I did Tufts. I wish I had done all my schooling at Tufts at Harvard. Um, I did four, one undergraduate program, only one, thank goodness, and then four, uh, I can't count, three um, grad programs. And so after all that schooling, I was about 100 years old when I came here as a faculty member. Um, I already had two of my kids. And... Um, I came to school and I kept going home and saying to my husband, there's something so weird about that school. It's a good, it's good, I really like it, but there's something so weird. And in about year two, I said that the thing that was weird is that the students were, and here's my word, happy. I know that sounds strange, but they're, the students here are, you know, they have anxiety and depression like other people, but the students on the whole um, are so well taken care of here. It's a really good blend of freedom and structure that most of them tend to be optimists, even, even when things are tough. And that was very different from my extremely long, decades long experience at Harvard. Let me add my one word. Uh, I was rejected by Harvard, by the way. Um, and, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. 
Um, and I just want to say, I see a lot of parents with, with youngsters in high school who are looking at schools, and I'm, I'm sort of a local kid, and I've got a long connection to Tufts, so they sometimes knock on my door. And, 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 and almost every high school student who comes to tour here says the same thing, which is that the students seem happy here. And that they seem, they're, they're obviously smart kids, and they're, they're working hard, but they don't seem overly competitive. But the word I would say is transform. This is a college, a university, where lives are transformed. And, and people who have the good fortune to come here and, and get a Tufts education leave here uh, having had their lives changed for the better uh, and, um, and have learned about themselves and about the world and want to leave here and go out and make a contribution. Right. Hi, magic question. Oh, okay. My question is for um, Dean Bauer. Um, what have been your um, greatest challenges um, in the last four years in your position uh, in, con in conjunction with um, SMFA? And what projects are in the pipeline? Great, thank you for your question. I think my greatest challenge is uh, avoiding my family who are mad at me because they can barely remember what I look like. Um, now the greatest, what is the greatest challenge? The greatest challenge is taking an art school when Tufts has never had a lot of um, offerings in the visual arts that's located on an entirely different understand, uh, campus with a very different understanding of what education um, looks like and integrating that into the university and reminding people without being obnoxious. I'm sure everyone else on this panel thinks that I've been obnoxious at various points. I, I call us the, uh, the, I call it a Horton Hears a Who phenomenon where I'm screaming, we're, we are here, we are here, we are here. So things will go out that say, we're having a wonderful thing happening on all three campuses and I have to be the jerky person who writes and says there's a fourth one. Um, at the level of what goes on um, at the school, and I should say too, this is a school that there was a reason the museum decided it didn't want the school anymore, which was that the school was losing a lot of money, like a lot of small art schools, and was uh, very severely um, in deficit, and we inherited that deficit um, and had a plan for getting out of it. Um, we still have that plan, has to be tweaked a little bit as we actually got in and discovered what was there. But the hardest thing for me is keeping the constituents of the school um, as excited and invested and hopeful as possible, while at the same time making sure that we are getting on financial, on, on the right financial footing. And to me, that first part of that mission is absolutely critical and essential. So I have to look for lots of ways to give people um, the kinds of, of freedom and structure so that they can actually do the things that they want to do. Um, and that's been, um, been very um, rewarding, I have to say. Um, we have an incredibly positive spirit at the school. Um, and it's also been hard at various points when I have to say, no, we can't do that right now because we're still getting to this different place. I'm sorry, I forgot the second half of your question. Oh, what projects are in the works? Um, oh my goodness, um, there's so many things going on that it's hard to, hard to say what all of, the, uh, what all of them are. Um, most of the projects that I'm trying to focus on are projects where we are collaborating either with other organizations in town, mostly organizations that are promoting civics, um, promoting health and wellness, um, promoting um, um, various ways of engaging our community um, as we do our artwork. Um, so we have a, a lot of huge emphasis on public art, on performance art, um, and we send our, our students and faculty all over the place to work on those kinds of things. Um, the, um, most of the, of the projects that we um, are invested in are ones that we are doing in collaboration with one of the other schools. Um, and we are also um, often collaborating with other schools, art schools in Boston. So there's something called the Pro Arts Consortium. It's the six major art schools in Boston, including the Massachusetts College of Art, Berkeley College of Music, Emerson College, and several others, um, including SMFA. And I'm the president of that organization. 
Um, and right before I came here, what I was doing was working with um, those presidents. Uh, we are putting on an enormous event for all six colleges um, next June as a way of trying to foment collaboration among artists. Um, so a lot of the things I'm doing are at the level of the students, but I'm also doing things like raising research money um, for our faculty members so that they can continue to do the work that they do. And we so far have been very lucky and people have been very generous and we've been able to do that. Another question? Hi there. Hi, Dean Aubrey. Uh, I mean, Provost Aubrey, you used to be Dean when we worked together at Northeastern, so great to see you. Um, First of all, uh, my son is happy, and he only applied to one school. Um, but um, one thing that he's observed, I know we all, you all talked about interdisciplinary, but one thing he's observed is not so much interdisciplinary happening actually in the classroom. And that I, by that I mean not as much um, opportunities to do projects together with his classmates. A lot of talking at, and not as much saying, okay, you group, go and do the work together to, to do that. I'm sure that, you know, it's just his freshman year and all of that, so I'm, I'm sure he'll experience it more, but can you talk about how you're working to make sure the students are actually collaborating in the classroom? Which program is your son in? Arts and Sciences? <laughs> Dean Glazer is going to take the question. <laughs> um, it, it, will, it will change, actually. You know, the first year is a year where you're sampling everything, and you do tend to find yourself in larger classes where that is more difficult. Um, there are some very progressive disciplines. Actually, the most progressive discipline in my opinion in the school with regard to pedagogy is the physics department. Um, and, and there's a sort of a, a spirit in the physics department to encourage more active learning and more collaborative, a more collaborative sort of approach to, to understanding those concepts. I don't understand them, so it's a little hard for me to, to um, describe exactly what they do since I haven't taken physics in 40 years. But, uh, but we're, uh, as, um, Dean Q mentioned, one of the things that we're very interested in is um, uh, the, the science of learning. And the science of learning suggests, I mean, there's lots and lots to know about it, but the science of learning suggests that an active learning environment is, is more um, uh, educational than, uh, than a passive one. Uh, we are um, establishing, we have established with a major gift to the university an institute on research and learning and instruction. We are doing cluster hires through the departments, both in, art, uh, both in arts and sciences and in engineering. Uh, we have a biologist who has a foot in the biology department and a foot in the education department. We have a, um, a mechanical engineer and a, um, we're hoping to land a chemical and biological engineer who will have feet in their home department and in the education department, and we are in the we are presently searching for a chemist uh, who will will have a foot in the chemistry department and a foot in the education department. And the idea is not just to have these people who have dual appointments, um, but they're doing research on our students, uh, and they would dis disseminate to their colleagues and then to the to the uh, uh, academia at large on what they find. Uh, we hope to be the place. Where, where this um, action is, is happening. Uh, and, um, and so I'm optimistic about it and, and feel like uh, we're gonna be able to put a stake in the ground in this. Just to add to that, um, by the way, I'm so pleased that when you say that I wasn't in the engineer school. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, Inter interdisciplinary um, education is actually written in the um, engineer school strategic planning. In the strategic plan, we clearly identify the top, the number one uh, uh, goal for the undergrad education is interdisciplinary. Uh, right now, uh, 
all the first year uh, engineering students will be taking the same class, multiple sessions, but they'll be taking the same class, right? And, and the reason we want to do that is we want them to get to know each other. We want to, uh, them to be experiencing the different faculties talking about different subjects. So the entire first year, uh, we call it EN1, the first semester, ES2, the second semester, all taking them together. Then in the sophomore and the junior years, we'll have uh, uh, seminar courses that all the students get to go together doing the same thing. We are thinking about this point of requiring uh, all the students to take at least one course from a different major that's arm length away from your own major. Uh, we already integrated in the capstone design for all the engineering students. The last year you have to do a capstone design. Uh, it's a project-based uh, course. And the capstone design are integrated across the different departments. So it might be one big project. You might be, your group might be in charge of the electrical design and the ME group might be the mechanical design and so forth. So, but they all do it together at the same team. Um, the other thing uh, in terms of uh, interdisciplinary learning is that uh, we have uh, converted uh, almost all the major based courses into team-based and project-based courses. So it's no longer just you sit there taking notes from the professor. We want you to work in the group. We want you to work on the project. You learn through by doing it. Uh, and, and, and we believe uh, that way of learning is the best way to uh, give the student the opportunity uh, to gain uh, sort of a leadership, communication skills, and so forth. Appreciate it, Tim. We are committed, of course, to uh, teamwork, uh, interdisciplinary teamwork in particular. Um, I've talked to a, a lot of the faculty, a lot of the committees, this new institute on uh, learning and instruction. We have another committee on teaching and learning. And uh, this is a, these are very, very proactive uh, 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 committees. Uh, of faculty and staff, the faculty themselves are very committed. I'm sorry that your son um, has not experienced this yet, but very, very soon I hope that he will have this wonderful experience um, like some of our other students. But we're running out of time, so I'd like to invite um, any of our pan panel members to give a piece of advice to you parents uh, before we close. So I think that Dean Glazer would like to say something. My advice would be let your student fight their own battles. And I'm going to tell two quick stories about my own personal experience. Day one of my daughter's experience here, she'd been on FOCUS, which is a pre-orientation program. She had a fantastic time, but she was, didn't get any sleep. And she was very tired, and she knocked on, or she came by my office, and she said, Dad, can I see you? And I said, sure. And she says, Dad, can I shut the door? And I said, uh, okay. And she came in, and she said, she shut the door, and she said, what am I doing here? Everybody's so smart. I'm never going to fit in, and I miss my old friends. Dad, what am I going to do? And I thought, oh, this was not at all what I was expecting. What do I say? And then herself excuse me, her cell phone rang, and she said, wait a second, Dad. She said, hello? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to join you for dinner. Dad, sorry, I can't stay and chat. <laughs> but I got to go with my new friend to dinner. So the, the, the lesson of that story is, is that a lot of the problems actually go away by themselves. <laughs> the second story is she, she calls me, uh, she's a senior now, she's living off campus. And she says, Dad, I, I'm really cold, it's March, I'm really cold. I said, well, why are you so cold? She goes, well, maybe the heat got turned off. I said, well, why did the heat get turned off? She said, well, maybe we didn't pay our bill. I said, well, why didn't you pay your bill? She said, well, maybe it came in a, a, an envelope instead of by email and we didn't know to open up the mail. 
And, and you want to know something? Honest to God, she learned so much from that experience. You can't solve all your kids' problems, but they can solve them and they learn from them. And there's something important about that. That's not to say that if there's not a big problem, we want to hear from you. We do. But if there's small problems, there's education in figuring it out. Well, as the father of two uh, young women, who, who one of whom went here and one of whom went to another school, and, um, I know how your kids are thinking already, well, what am I going to, you know, what, am I, what career am I going to plan for? Uh, what major am I going to choose? Um, you know, how am I going to make, make it when I get out of here? And this is a, such a unique opportunity, this period of their lives. Um, I've, I had occasion to live in Spain for a few years, and, and the, high, the system of higher education is so different. You declare, you know, you go to law school as an undergraduate, and you go, you train to be a doctor. And, and young people don't have the opportunity there to really as much for real liberal arts edu or well-rounded educations um, to take advantage, to learn things that they never thought that they would be interested in, and to really find themselves. Um, I came here as a freshman uh, bourbon kid from Brookline, Massachusetts. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer. He wanted me to go to Harvard. I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't become a lawyer. And I, um, I developed a relationship with a, with a faculty, a faculty person. I fell under the spell of, one of, my, of a mentor who really helped me blossom intellectually. And I, I got interested in a completely different area. And, um, uh, and I took a variety of courses that I never would have imagined. So I guess my advice is uh, chill. Uh, let your kids chill a little bit. Encourage them to take advantage of this, this moment in their lives, which is not going to come around again, and where they're really going to have opportunities to grow intellectually in ways you know, that are really unique and at a really important time, to grow socially, emotionally, to grow as citizens, and just encourage them to take as much advantage of this feast of opportunity as they possibly can. Thank you. Yeah. Just a few, um, a few words now. Yeah. I, I have, I have uh, one child, a daughter. Uh, when she was in high school, my wife and I, um, when she was a high school senior, we, we had a curfew at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to come back uh, by 11, and otherwise you have to tell us exactly where you are, contact numbers and everything, right? So uh, the first time she uh, came home um, uh, in her first year in college, it was during uh, Thanksgiving time. So before she came home, my wife and I talked about this. We said, well, now she's a college kid, uh, college student, still grown up. Uh, we should relax the curfew a little bit. How about 12 o'clock? <laughs> so we, we made that decision. And the first day she came home, we had dinner, and my wife, uh, thought this will be a big opportunity to present this to her. So <laughs> said, now you're a college student, you're grown up, so we trust you. So uh, we're going to move uh, the, the curfew back to uh, you know, 12 o'clock. And she looked at my wife and I says, it's like we were from uh, uh, Mars or something, she said, Mom, uh, over the last three months, did you know what time I came back to my dorm? And so my wife now looked at her and said, well, you know, she has a point, right? Um, I said, okay, fine. Stay as late as you want. We don't care. And it turns out she came back um, around 10.30. <laughs> and so I asked her, why did you come back so early? Oh, I have a project due, you know, uh, next week. So this is said in a matter of fact, right? So, you know, the lessons uh, that my wife and I learned from that episode is that just relax, you know, let it go. Uh, you know, you trust yourself that you actually have done a really good job in instilling um, in your child uh, the ethics, the values, the judgment, and the work ethics that they will make the right decision uh, for their own life in the future. So that would be my one piece of advice. Yeah.
I'm sorry, just let me add one quick thing. And the Raising children is like bowling. You let the ball go, and all you can do is wave your arms. <laughs> and the final word from Dean Bauer, and then we'll close. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of pressure on me here because yes, they've all already there's not said much time. <laughs> the I'm same afraid. thing multiple times. Um, the um, one thing I would say is to refrain from giving them advice because a lot of times what happens is the advice that you give them is counteracting the advice that they're getting from their peers and their teachers and it actually just confuses them more. Um, and I know this, as I said, from uh, having all these children who multiple times said, stop talking, to, to follow your own advice. We've heard you tell so many generations of parents not to give advice and you're doing it. So try to refrain and, and trust that they will be okay. And also trust that we are really good about staying on top of them, as John then said, um, in a way that is unobtrusive. We don't have hidden cameras. We don't go into their rooms with flashlights. We don't bother them. But we have a really good way, an easy way, for other students to report when somebody seems not to be doing so well or faculty members to just casually do it. We know how to sort of just very gently find them. And so just trust that that safety net um, is there. I will let you know if something's really wrong. And these, thank you very much. <laughs> On these wise final words, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to also thank you for everything you do for your children, our students, and I wish you the very best. I wish them the very best for the rest of the semester and a wonderful journey here at Tufts. And I'd like to ask you to join me in uh, thanking our wonderful panel of deans today. Thank you. <laughs>